Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. I'm Dr. Ashley, and today I'm gonna be sharing with you a critique that I recorded with Dr. Doug in his studio on the new Netflix series called You Are What You Eat. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. Okay, so Dr. Ashley, mm -hmm. thank you for being here with me. Um, and I'm super excited to get your perspective on this because I know we talk about nutrition a lot at home. You talk about it from one angle from with your your clients, and I talk about it with my patients. But we both watched this documentary. Um, and from your perspective, from a weight loss perspective, how do you feel like this type of content impacts your clients and their success in weight loss? It impacts in a significant way. Uh, you know, I, I the series came across having this perspective that they were completely open, not biased toward the omnivore diet versus the vegan diet. But if you watch it and maybe watch it carefully, you'll see how it was so biased from the beginning into supporting the vegan way of life. And from my 15 plus years of helping over 7,000 people drop weight, reverse type 2 diabetes, re you know, reverse high blood pressure, I have not seen the vegan diet be the way, at least you know, for the majority of people. Maybe there are a select few who can do well on it. But for those of us really struggling with obesity, overweight, metabolic dysfunction, the vegan diet does not allow for remission. And, yeah. and so it's a huge issue because we were even flying on an airplane <laughs> while we were watching this. And there were other people watching it and talking about how they just can't enjoy their steak dinner. And we were like, no, no, please go enjoy your steak dinner. It's a huge issue. Yeah. We are spreading nonsense. Yeah. and But I want to go through the, the actual uh, documentary because they do bring up some really interesting points mm -hmm. and there are some areas of concern. Um, and I think the way that they spend the data is really is actually fun to look at. I love looking at interpretation for people that have different opinions as me, um, because sometimes it makes me look at things a different way or sometimes it further digs in my bias either way. Um, so one of the things that's important to remember about this uh, movie is that it was funded by Impossible Meats, mm -hmm. so a, a plant-based food company, um, and it was championed by several of the people that you see in the movie, Mayor Adams uh, of New York City, other high-level officials, notorious uh, plant-based doctors. So you kind of see the same cast of characters as, as other movies uh, or series that have been similar, like um, What the Health mm -hmm. and Game Changers kind of like the same cast of characters. But I feel like what's happening is we're seeing more and more people watch these movies. So I feel compelled to, rather than just ignore them like I've done in the past, like let's actually respond to it. Um, so I have um, the study pulled up and I have some figures of the study pulled up. And for those that are listening to this, I'll describe them. But the study that actually came out that the series is based off of was published in 2023 in JAMA. And it's called The Cardiometabolic Effects of an omnivore versus vegan diet or diets in identical twins, a randomized clinical trial. So <clears throat> let me just give you the background. So this was a, a randomized trial of 22 twins actually uh, that started out, 21 finished. And the goal was to look at the difference between a vegan diet and an omnivore diet over the course of eight weeks. And at first glance, I actually love this idea. I would love it if there were good studies that showed a well-designed carnivore diet to a vegan diet, mm -hmm. a Mediterranean diet to a paleo diet, right? Like let's actually look at some of these ways of eating and get a sense of, of, what, um, of what the differences really are. Unfortunately, because there was so much bias in this, uh, both the study and the movie, we don't really get a good sense of the difference between the two. But even with a subtle difference between the two, you actually see some really interesting outcomes. So um, what I thought was good about this too is that they provided food for half of the study. Probably would have been more powerful if they provided food for the whole study if you really want to see a difference between diets. But the benefit there is that you're not um, you're not letting the participants add some uh, challenges and tweaks to the diet. They're actually getting what they get, assuming they're not eating anything else. Um, and then they did four weeks on their own. So they got food for four weeks, did four weeks on their own. Um, it was randomized, so they didn't get to choose who was vegan and omnivore. The vegans were chosen randomly. And then the omnivore is the same way. And so... In the study, the, uh, the, the research study, they say their primary outcome they're looking for, because they call it cardiometabolic health. One of my biggest challenges here is one of their primary outcome is LDL cholesterol, which is, uh, I would say, an outdated metric. 
it is a biomarker of interest, but it is not the most important biomarker from cardio or metabolic health. Mm -hmm. um, and then they talk about their secondary outcomes of fasting insulin, which I am super interested in. And I know you talk a lot about insulin, body weight, HDL and triglycerides and TMAO. Now, the Netflix series actually came out with other things, too. So they were talking about these things like the microbiome, um, genital blood flow while watching pornography and telomere length. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, those weren't included in the JAMA publication. No, they weren't. I wonder why. So um, what's your thought on, because I know you get asked this a lot. Mm -hmm. So when people ask you about LDL cholesterol, because yeah. these guys have probably heard me talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on LDL cholesterol when your patients, your clients say, I'm eating this way, I've lost a bunch of weight, my diabetes is reversed, but my LDL went up. I mean, I, I tell them not to look at LDL, actually. <laughs> um, we know that it's not, the just like you said, the greatest predictor of overall heart health or wellness. And uh, so really what matters when you're looking at a basic lipid panel is HDL and triglycerides. Yeah. So we want to see HDL go up and we want to see triglycerides drop. Oh, and we'll get to those results mm -hmm. later. Um, so in the movie, right out of the gate, after they do this uh, discussion of the... Um, of the participants, you meet Dr. Grieger, who is a, a notorious plant-based um, uh, physician. And then you meet Cory Booker, who's a senator, who's obviously an advocate. Um, and they bring up this idea of food deserts. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting here is that this, like a number of other things they talk about in the series, is actually an important problem. And if you're not familiar with food deserts, food deserts are these areas in the country where people don't have access to to fresh fruits and vegetables, which is what they're saying here, or good quality meat. Mm -hmm. It's just um, either fast food or- A gas station. A gas station. Snicker bars. Yeah, I mean, a grocery store. I actually did a rotation through one of these places mm -hmm. and um, it was amazing. And the grocery store, literally, <clears throat> it would be like taking a good grocery store and eliminating the outside of it. Mm -hmm. Which is where you're supposed to shop, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I remember driving around looking for something to eat and just really confused as to how people actually lived in that space. So I totally get it. This is a big mm -hmm. problem. But at the end of the movie, they, they come up with a solution, which uh, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, what's frustrating in the beginning here is they talk about, uh, they bring up a food desert. Then they say, oh, well, if you compare it, though, to next door Loma Linda, they were talking about a, a food desert in California. Yeah, they're like five miles apart. Right. Yeah, five miles apart uh -huh. is Loma Linda. And Loma Linda is um, um, a community of uh, Seventh-day Adventists. And the Seventh-day Adventists have been studied and have one of the longest lifespans of anybody in the world. And so the uh, plant-based advocates uh, really like to um, uh, use and tout this as a reason to eat a vegan diet. But what's interesting is you can't just say you know these two areas are the only two areas of interest because if you look at other areas similar to Loma Linda like the um, LDS community or the Mormon community in Salt Lake City they've also been studied very similar to the Loma Linda Seventh-day Adventist community also have a similarly long lifespan and they eat meat and so I hear this argument a lot about Loma Linda um, and that because they're vegans that's the reason why they live longer but yeah. it's not. What else would you think it would well, be? Well, when you're watching the show, you know, they're uh, the folks in Loma Linda, they're outside, they're working out, there's pictures of them exercising, they're uh, in a community, they're socializing with each other. I think they had them out there like meditating, doing breath work, and then they compare that to the food desert where people were up late at night, you know, working in gas stations, drinking alcohol, drinking alcohol, just, cigarettes. oh my gosh, all of these things. And then they said, well, it was the animal protein That's right. that caused all the issues. So that just out of the gate, you're like, oh boy, here we go. Let's, let's let the bias begin. Um, all right. And so then the next big thing they talked about was cheese. Mm -hmm. So cheese is interesting. Now on the PhD program, Correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but you're not a big advocate of cheese while people are losing weight. I know. It's Is so that true. because it's not vegan? <laughs> no. Well, our main reason why we let go of cheese is because, I mean, like she said, it's addictive. Right. <laughs> um, but also it's just so dense in energy and it is a trigger food for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I personally can't go and eat an inch by inch size cube and say, OK, gosh, I'm done with the cheese. I love cheese. And so for our folks who are breaking food addictions, who are really focusing on trigger foods and overeating and binging, we just let go of those foods so they're not a temptation. But 
we do allow them to come back once the client's in maintenance and can potentially enjoy it in more moderation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm an advocate for cheese too, but I know when I eat a lot of dairy, I do tend to gain more weight. Mm -hmm. It's easier for me to gain weight when I'm eating dairy. What's interesting here is they talk about the case of morphine, which is a real thing, and it is it does work through the, the same pathway as narcotics. Um, so there is an addictive component to it, but I don't know anybody that um, actually gets that sick off of cheese. You don't you do stop eventually, um, but you tend to eat too much. But what's interesting here is they say that the saturated fat in the cheese causes an increase in cholesterol and diabetes. They just throw that out there. I know they always add diabetes in there. Yeah. Um, and then they also threw out this one that I thought was interesting that dairy uh, consumption of dairy is associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's and prostate mm -hmm. cancer. And that's going to be has to be based off of an epidemiological study that has so many confounding variables. Mm -hmm. um, and then this was my favorite quote, dairy and meat are ancestrally unnatural. Mm -hmm. So we listen to a variety of people. Um, and I don't know what to think about this ancestrally unnatural comment because you recently interviewed um, Dr. Ken Berry. Yeah, Dr. Ken Berry. Mm -hmm. So if you know who Dr. Ken Berry is, he's um, an, an advocate for a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. And what did he say was the ancestral diet? Meat. Meat. And just meat and organ meat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I haven't done the research myself. Um, I feel like people would have wanted to consume meat because it was such a good energy source. Mm -hmm. um, and that fruit and vegetables because we didn't we didn't um we weren't farming so there wasn't that much to begin with yeah like if you go walk around the forest there's not heads of lettuce coming out of the ground you yeah. know we we created that so i think ancestrally now she's right uh, dairy probably true right mm -hmm. because nobody was milking cows um but meat is ancestrally consistent i'm mm -hmm. pretty sh i'm pretty sure they probably did eat some fruits and yeah. nuts and things when they had to but I doubt that was their preference. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so then the next thing is they bring in the trainer. So um, I don't know if I have this name right, Nemal Delgado. Mm. That's what I wrote down. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I don't know him. Um, but he's a, a plant-based uh, uh, advocate and he's a uh, athletic trainer. And what I, I reason why I even bring this up is that I love this quote because it's gonna come back to this at the end, which is, if you don't have muscle, you will be unhealthy. Mm -hmm. If you don't have muscle, you will be unhealthy. So um, keep that in mind when we talk about the results. All right, so then they get into visceral fat. So this is where I want, I want Dr. Ashley to talk about her perspective of visceral fat and what they said in the movie. And then also they get into the microbiome. But let's start visceral mm -hmm. fat um, because this is your baby. Yeah, well, I was really excited that they mentioned visceral fat. And I also like the fact they, they had some good things in here. I like the fact that they talked about body composition and BMI being a rudimentary measurement. So if you go to the doctor and they just look at your health as it comes with BMI, you know that you need to change your practitioner because BMI is not telling you anything. It just looks at height and weight and doesn't look at what your body's actually made up of. So we could have, you know, Dr. Doug here at how much do you weigh? 202 pounds. 202 pounds, body fat percentage of what, 10, 10%, something like that. And you could have another fellow here and he could be 202 pounds, but 25 to 30% body fat. So right. we could have two guys weighing the same amount, but total different picture of health. And so I like the fact that they talked about that. Yeah. Uh, visceral fat is the deep belly fat. I'm really glad they focused on it because visceral fat is a different type of fat than the rest of the body. It's the stuff that fills up the organs, it wraps around them, it squeezes uh, it, the organs and it grows its own blood vessels. And over time, it, it, it starts to secrete its own oxygen supply. So I like to look at visceral fat like a tumor. All it wants to do is get fatter as fast as possible and it causes inflammation in the body. And we know that all of disease stems from inflammation. We know that weight gain is stemming from inflammation. So if you have this belly fat in there, you're gonna have high levels of inflammation. And so I do think in the study they said that saturated fat and animal mm -hmm. protein causes visceral fat to develop, which is complete bogus. <laughs> so what causes visceral fat? What causes visceral fat? Well, a few things, but the primary thing that I see is overeating your carbohydrate tolerance level, overeating sugar and processed carbs, over drinking alcohol, being sedentary, not sleeping well, and having high levels of stress. Yeah. 
I agree with that. I've read some interesting theories on how saturated fat could provoke visceral fat, but I don't think we've ever seen that play out. Um, and with so many people doing carnivore and mm -hmm. keto and eliminating um, visceral fat while consuming, I mean, main, mainlining saturated fat, I don't see how um, those theories could really play out. Okay, so then they get into the microbiome. Now, I'm, I'm an advocate for the microbiome. I test the microbiome. Um, but what they're saying here is I, I just don't necessarily agree with. But what I want really Dr. Ashley to talk about, they, they go through the, the concept of the mucus lining of the gut. Mm -hmm. um, so just dig into that. I don't, I don't want to steal your thunder on this. It's well, too funny for me. I was sitting on the airplane, you know, watching this and, and I had the sound canceling headphones on. So I didn't know how loud I was speaking. You're on an airplane. It's really loud. And so I watched this part of the show and I was like, no way. I like screamed so it. I didn't know loud. it. And he's like, dude, you know, Ashley, you're, you're screaming really loud. And then he tapped the lady sitting. I was sitting in the middle seat and he's like, sorry, ma'am. She's yelling. She's she's watching a psychological thriller. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it felt like that. So basically what she was saying, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but she was saying that we have um, a lining filled with our, our bacteria, mm -hmm. right? And and then in, inside that, we've got this mucus lining, and then we've got our intestinal wall, mm -hmm. and that protects from the, berry, the, the blood, mm -hmm. bloodstream, right? So we want to have this healthy mucus lining so that our gut bacteria isn't filtering through and leaky gut, right? right? Yep. And so she said that uh, what creates the gut lining is uh, carbohydrates, right? That is made from carbohydrate in right. there. And that if we aren't um, consuming enough plant-based carbohydrate, then our microbiome will start consuming our ourselves. Like we'll start eating ourselves from the inside out. Yeah. They literally had a, an image, like a, a little cartoon of the stomach uh, of the, the GI tract being just like melted away yeah. uh, because the GI bugs were eating the gut. It was yeah, it's pretty yeah. funny. Um, I, I think what's really funny there is... Um, fear mongering. It's totally fear mongering. They do this throughout. But I think what was also really funny is they, they, they talk about this a few times where it's like you have to consume plant-based carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And I, you're the... PhD nutritionist. Mm -hmm. Are there any carbohydrates that aren't plant-based? I don't know. Someone's going to probably prove me wrong by saying no. I, I, <laughs> I feel like I feel like they're just trying to get the words plant-based out there more commonly by saying that. You could just say carbohydrates. So just to let you know that if you follow a carnivore diet, not saying that you should, but if you do, you're not going to start to eat yourself from the inside out. Yeah. All right. So the next cool thing that they talked about is the epigenetic clock. Now, this is a really interesting area of research that I'm totally into. So I have a uh, health span practice. We're looking for longevity. I'm all about kind of the anti-aging principles. But when we look at the epigenetic clock tools, one of the things they measure is telomeres. Mm -hmm. And telomeres, in theory, they get shorter as a cell gets older. Mm -hmm. And then the cell goes through one of two processes to get rid of itself. Um, the longer the telomeres, the more likely we are to age better or to live longer. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is we know that there are some things that you can do that will dramatically shorten or lengthen telomeres, but we don't really know what that means. So to, to say that this is a surrogate for any kind of longevity outcome is a pretty wild claim. Um, and they kind of go through this whole thing. And then they say, again, saturated fat and hormones and animals cause dementia. <laughs> like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that was the end of episode one. So then we, we dig into episode two. So episode two they get into this blood flow in um, blood flow in the genitals, uh, kind of like they did in the Game Changers movie, which I actually didn't watch, but I heard plenty of things about it. Um, and I don't even want to dig into this. I don't want to waste the time on it. But basically, I think this is garbage technology. In the research, in the results, they only talk about two out of the twenty-one couples. Mm -hmm. um, so who knows what the other couples looked like? My guess is that they cherry picked some data to make it look cool, and they like to talk about sex because sex is sexy. So then we'll just move on from there. Now, this one's really interesting. This next section um, is uh, Mayor Adams from New York. So Mayor Adams tells his story where he went vegan to reverse diabetes. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but um, you've reversed diabetes in hundreds, mm -hmm. right, of people. Yeah. Um, have you ever used a plant-based diet to do that? I've not. Do you think it's possible? I think it's possible. So why don't we do this for everybody? What's your experience with the way that you do it? And why don't you think that a plant-based 
avenue of doing it is the the easier or right way to do it? I'm ultimately looking for sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we know when it comes from a sustainability perspective, we need to maintain muscle mass. And it is very hard, as indicated by the results of the study, to maintain muscle mass when you're on a plant-based diet. I'm not saying that it's impossible. I think anything's possible. But it's very difficult. Uh, we need to get adequate vitamins and minerals in the diet so that uh, you know we're not losing hair. That's one beautiful thing about PhD is that our clients don't lose significant hair. Their skin actually looks great when they're done. They look they age regress a decade in how they look and feel, and it's because they're having a nutrient dense diet that's filled with adequate protein and healthy fat. So while I'm sure you can find a way to reverse diabetes with a plant based diet, I don't believe that it's sustainable and the healthiest way to go about it. Yeah, I think it would be hard for most people. Yeah. And and the challenge that I see, because we see this in our practice as well, um, is that we gener generally will use carbohydrate restriction as mm -hmm. the primary tool. It's impossible to do that to any significant extent eating a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. I think what happened probably, and I don't, I don't know Mayor Adam's story, but my guess is what happened with Mayor Adam's story is that he was probably eating a pretty unhealthy diet. And then when you go through the elimination process of going into a vegan diet, you're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. You're going to actually probably feel great for a period of time. And depending on your starting point, you could likely see reversal of diabetes, insulin resistance, improval. So I think you can see a lot of these benefits and, and we see that in other studies, but you're right. The challenge is, do you do this long term? Mm -hmm. And I've worked with enough patients now who have been vegan, especially now in the bone health community, a lot of people that were vegan for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, it's probably one of the things that led to their bone loss. Mm -hmm. um, and they all have a, a lifespan of being vegan and they just they just get so tired of it. And then they realize that their health is, is suffering as a result of it. Mm -hmm. So I just I, I struggle with that because he's in the short term, right? He's like newly diagnosed. Oh, I don't know how recently, but mm -hmm. probably recently diagnosed. So he still feels pretty good. Um, so we'll see how that turns out over time for him. All right, and then we get into the cancer talk, and I love this conversation. Um, and of course, this is Dr. Grieger, uh, and he's a, a huge advocate for plant-based, and um, I have refuted many of his um, descriptions of studies and going through study results. Um, he does this a lot on his website. He does a lot of stuff on osteoporosis. So I've, re I've read and listened to and refuted a number of his, of his claims. So one of the quotes he has in here is that, that it is a matter of life and death to recognize that meat causes cancer. And then, of course, he's talking about the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer and how they've uh, said that uh, processed meat and all meat uh, is a carcinogen. But they even say, the World Health Organization will say that all of this comes from epidemiologic studies. The evidence is poor. And if you look at um, any of the evidence that uses uh, a, a, a prospective style or intervention like, then uh, you don't see that cancer involvement. In fact, the cancer rates actually go down. So pretty much all. Can you explain what an epidemiological study is? And I sure why can. It's not yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So epidemiological studies are basically where you look generally backwards in time, mm -hmm. and you say, okay, we're going to look at this massive group of people, and we're going to start to point out like um, who ate meat, and based off of usually food frequency questionnaires, mm -hmm. so recall, food recall, who did this, who had what outcome, um, and then you start trying to put together the pieces. And epidemiology is, is a powerful tool in, in the realm of medical research. You just can't draw statistics. Uh, I'm sorry, statistics, yes. You can't draw conclusions that you should make recommendations from. Mm -hmm. So we see this in the nutrition space all the time. We do. So sad. We need to do prospective studies. Epidemiology is good for making a hypothesis, a theory, but then you have to prove your theory. And that's the, that's the missing part here is that there is no study that has ever proven that meat causes cancer in a prospective study. All right, so then we get on to uh, being, uh, we can see the interview with Pat Brown, the CEO of Impossible Meats, and then we get into the environmental side. So he says something here, and I wanna show this to you because uh, I haven't shown this to Dr. Ashley yet. So um, the first figure I wanna show here is from the um, USDA. So the USDA is responsible for measuring greenhouse gas emissions. Now, what he says is that, I believe he says that 30, what does he say? 30%. I actually didn't write it down. He said some really high number, like 35% or something of greenhouse gas emissions comes. I think he said from cows. He may have said from agriculture, which would be more accurate, but it was a really high number. 
much higher than I've ever heard. If you look at the statistic from the uh, USDA, you can see very clearly what's that percentage that's agriculture? Around 10.6%. 10, 10.6%. And agriculture includes both animals and plants. So it's mm -hmm. all agriculture. So um, if you start breaking this down by animal, you can see about half of, half of it comes from animals, half of it comes from plants. And about, I don't know, a half to a third comes from cows. And this is what he was saying. I think it was, you know, so much of this comes from cows. But there's other components to consider here, too. And I've looked at this in so much depth because this is something that I, I, I am actually concerned about is, well, gosh, are we destroying the environment? Should we be looking at other options? But here's the rub. They talk about methane. They talk about greenhouse gases. They don't really talk about carbon dioxide. And there are so many ways to spin these numbers to make it look terrible. But here's the thing to remember. Plants produce methane when they decompose. Cows eat plants, which decompose in their stomach, and then they produce methane. Those plants are actually going to produce methane regardless of whether or not the cows eat them or not. So take that for what it is. But when they produce methane, methane is a short-lived greenhouse gas, short-lived by about 12 years. Um, and it is a very, very small percentage of the atmosphere. I, have, I, have, I wrote it down, 0.00018% of the atmosphere. And it's not getting bigger very fast. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, which is produced more by petrol, burning petroleum and um, you know, a lot of other things, carbon dioxide is a much bigger percentage of the atmosphere and is increasing rapidly and sticks around for centuries. So yes, it's, it's an issue. I think methane and carbon dioxide are both things that we should be concerned about. But really, when you look at this graph from the USDA, you see that transportation is almost 30%, industry is 30%, commercial and residential is 30%. I think we got bigger fish to fry. So rather than worry about the meat, how about let's worry about where the meat is coming from, mm -hmm. where the plants are coming from. Did it come from Taiwan? Did you ship in your whatever grains from South America? Um, so I think that there's bigger things to worry about here. So then we get to episode three. Now, um, episode three, they start by talking about chickens. And um, what do you think about chicken as a source of protein? Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gets I like, my vote. I like chicken too. The, the problem I have with chicken over beef is that chickens only have one stomach, uh, just like pigs. And so if they are eating GMO grains, mm -hmm. you're going to get GMO stuff mm -hmm. in your meat. Um, Potentially higher omega-6s, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so they go through this whole thing, and this is an environmental challenge. And this is one of the things that they point out that I do wish we had a good solution for. They talk about these things called CAFOs, which are concentrated mm -hmm. animal feeding operations. There's chicken CAFOs, there's cow CAFOs, there's, I guess you call them cattle CAFOs. Um, and they are pretty terrible, yep. right? Um, you know, putting thousands of chickens in a little barn and then having a two by two box that sits outside the barn and then calling them pasture raised. I mean, it's, it's a mess. And yes, that needs to be improved. Um, they go through this whole thing of talking about the antibiotics and antibiotic resistance and all this stuff. And then I actually skip. They do this whole study uh, where they're trying to look at um, the bacteria on the, on the animals. And actually, I want to talk about it. Can I talk about it? Yeah. All right. So they do this thing, um, which is frustrating. So they, they go through the process of saying how dirty chicken is. And then they go through the process of in the um, grocery store saying that vegetables are not allowed to have bacteria on them, mm -hmm. which is kind of a funny statement. But chicken is because you can't get all the bacteria off. Fair enough. Um, I don't think the vegetables are sterile, though, to be no. fair. So they must be measuring certain bacteria. But anyway, so then they um, they cover this chicken with one of the participants of the study. They cover this chicken with this uh, material that will glow uh, under a, a, a dark light. Mm -hmm. Is that the right word? Yeah. Dark light. Um, and so then they uh, they cover it and then they have them prepare the chicken, you know, wash their hands like they're supposed to and do all the things. And then they go around the kitchen. They look and see where they touched. Mm -hmm. And it was everywhere. It was on the cabinets. It was on the sink. It was on the, the clean dishes and all this mm -hmm. stuff. So basically, they were saying, like, you've contaminated your, your kitchen with E. coli and you're all going to die. Mm. And one of the claims that they actually made is that there's a million cases per year of foodborne illness due to chicken. Mm. And I, I, I was pretty sure that that was bullshit. But that's actually true. <laughs> um, so I looked that up and the CDC actually supports that claim. But what they say is cook your meat, meaning that people are eating undercooked meat. As the primary so we're not getting sick from the bacteria that is on the cabinet handle. 
but we're getting sick from uncooked chicken. Yeah, that, that's what the CDC was basically saying. And my issue with this whole process is to say, well, first of all, how about, did the stuff that they put on there, like was that oil based? Like, can, does that actually wash off easily? Um, or, you know, was it like they washed their hands and the bacteria is gone, but the stuff is still there? Like, mm. who knows? Um, but also you think about how much meat, how much chicken, um, and people are not good. I mean, we we are so like meticulous about like washing your hands and using the right color and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because I took a food safety and sanitation class, you're protected. But most people are not that way. <laughs> and if this were really a problem, I think we would see a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. um, but additionally, we also see a lot of disease from vegetables. So vegetables aren't immune to this either. This is mm -hmm. one of those areas where they like to point out, well, meat is bad. And then they don't talk about the vegetable side. Mm -hmm. But we see lots of issues from vegetable contamination too. And it's just an issue. I think you have to always be careful with all your food. Um, I think the big difference here is that vegetables are allowed to be eaten raw and chicken's not. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's that discrepancy. So um, I don't think a reason to not eat meat is because of the bacteria. I think that's kind of silly. Um, all right. So then they go back to the food deserts for a little bit. And I just wanted to touch on this one more time because I think the answer to this is it's an economy issue. It's not a food issue. They don't have access to any good food. Yeah. So I think working on the economy, providing better jobs, encouraging businesses to open better avenues for food is the answer to food deserts, not to eat a vegan diet. Because how are they going to eat a vegan diet? Mm -hmm. They're like, going to end up eating a highly I mean, processed Doritos. vegan diet. Doritos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Skittles. Twinkies. Yeah. Are those vegan? Probably. Uh, I don't know if those are vegan. Then they talk about fish. This was a really sad area because I don't like farm-raised fish anyway. And this is just another, um, just a scare tactic around eating farm-raised fish. We are overfishing the oceans. Yeah. I don't know the solution to that. I don't think that fish is, are the solution to avoiding cows and pigs. Um, they did some funny scare tactics here. They talk about the salmon blood virus mm -hmm. and the salmon blood virus and how it's in all of these fish. And we don't know what it does in humans. Um, if you study any species, there are a lot of viruses that we've never studied. Um, that we're around, potentially that we eat. Um, so again, more fun scare tactics. And then they go back to dairy and they talk about cashew-based dairy. So this was really interesting. So um, this this cheese looked pretty good. I kind of want to try it. Mm, but one of the, maybe. But one of the things they said in here, and this is um, another. I would love to find the statistics on this, but they don't put their sources in here. They say to make a block. I don't know how big the block was, but to make a block of regular cheese. It takes a thousand gallons of water, but to make a block the same size of cashew based cheese, it only takes a half a gallon of water. Wow. Right. Did they grow the cashews in the ground? How much water does it take to grow cashews? Mm, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know the that. answer to that, but I feel like there's a little manipulation of statistics there. Um, a lot of times when they talk about cows and water, um, they'll talk about the pasture that the cows are on and they'll measure all the water that came down. And they'll say that that water was required for those cows to do whatever it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. But that water is going to fall on that pasture, whether those cows are there or not. And they actually don't consume most of it. So again, just manipulation of statistics. All right. So then here's another great quote. If you give someone the option to save the planet or not save the planet, it's a no brainer. Would you agree with that? I agree. I agree with that too. But yet they fail to actually show how eating a vegan diet will save the planet. They like to talk about all the ills and the downsides of cows, but they don't actually talk about how plants are the solution. Mm -hmm. So they get into this uh, inefficiency of cows. So they talk about the fact that it takes 25 pounds of grain for one pound of meat. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea if that's true. But then they start getting into fake meat. So they're talking about impossible meats. They're talking about all this stuff. But here's what they don't talk about when they talk about plant-based meats is they don't talk about the inefficiency of lab-grown meat. How much energy does it take to grow any appreciable amount of meat? Um, they use mushrooms in this uh, particular example. Where do you grow the mushrooms? What kind of space does that take? Is it possible to scale those things? Like all of these questions, they didn't say any of it. They just said that it's getting better. So looking in the production of them making the fake meats and the fake cheeses reminds me of the labs and the production centers of where we created margarine, you right. know, 
And we thought, oh my gosh, and it was marketed to us the same way. Like butter is dirty, cows are dirty, pigs are dirty. You don't want to do this. And I think the commercials when they were promoting margarine was like looking at a dirty ass farm and being like, you don't want to touch this. And then they show the really clean steel, oh. pros, pr pristine centers where they're making margarine. And we're like, surely man-made is better than nature's made. And we go back and we start to eat all this margarine and realize, holy crap, how much heart disease yeah. did that cause? And here we're repeating it again. What's the difference? Why is it better? Why is it better? Why would it be better than what nature yeah, has Yeah, I think made? what we do, what we do, we get so excited around it. And there's, there's money in it, right? So let's be clear. Mm -hmm. Like there's financial, a lot of financial gain. Um, to make something that can replace something that everybody needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably true back then too, right? Or like, hey, every baby needs needs mm -hmm. to drink something. Mm -hmm. Let's make formula. And, you know, that way women don't have to breastfeed mm -hmm. as if that was a problem. So um, maybe for some babies. Yeah. It and like it's problem, good. It's, it right? it so like, serves a purpose a, for a role, sure. I'm not like, saying that. But, but margarine does not serve a role. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, okay. So this is where it gets super fun. So now we get the results and I'm excited. Um, so let me actually, before we go through these results, let me pull up this chart. So this is from the study. Um, so this is the macronutrient distribution, um, and calorie distribution of, of the diet. Yeah. So I think, um, again, I was super excited to actually read this study cause I would love to see a good study. Um, if you're going to do, if anybody's out there, that's going to do a study and you're going to do a vegan versus paleo versus omnivore versus whatever please make them isocaloric, mm -hmm. meaning same calories, because calories, I don't want to say calories count, calories count to some extent, but if you have a significant difference, you have to account for that difference. So what they did here is they, they measured people at baseline and then they delivered their food and there was almost a 200 calorie difference between groups mm -hmm. per day. And that's significant and we'll see that. Um, and then uh, when they, the, the second four weeks, it shifted a little bit um, it didn't actually get closer. It stayed about the same. They both started eating more when they cooked their own food, which is not surprising. And then the protein um, composition was actually surprisingly not that different either. Um, I have that here somewhere. But basically what the protein um, and macronutrient composition looks like is that the vegans were a little bit more protein deficient. But honestly, the omnivores didn't have it wasn't like a high protein diet. It wasn't a high protein diet, but they did consume more. It was more, but it wasn't as, is what, like if I wanted to show a difference, mm. I would make them more different, right? Mm -hmm. Like I would eat like a healthy whole food vegan diet and then I would have an omnivore diet that had my preference more protein. I didn't mm -hmm. actually do the math, but I get they, I bet they weren't, I bet they weren't getting one gram per pound. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. So I would want to see that difference. All right, but let's get into the actual twins. All right, so again, 21 made it to the end. Um, one of the vegan um, uh, people after the first four weeks dropped out Darn it. and they said it was because of their work schedule. Oh, could have been, may have been, um, we'll never know. All right. So then we get into the, the results and the first one is this, these two, uh, these two guys who were both, um, they're kind of youngish, mm -hmm. um, kind of like young family business types and they loved cheese. That was like their thing, right? They made cheese. Did they make cheese? I think they did. Yeah. So they loved cheese. So for the guy to go vegan it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then like he pulled the card for uh, when they were randomized and he was really sad. Um, so anyway, the first guy, you want to go through the first guy, talk about the, the up and downs, the ups and downs. Sure. Yeah. So uh, one fellow, Michael, he was the omnivore and his weight <clears throat> stayed about the same. He dropped 3.8 pounds of fat and he gained about the same amount in muscle, which is huge. So wait. You're telling mm -hmm. me he lost fat and gained muscle. He I was did. told that's impossible. I know. He just did the impossible. In eight weeks, actually. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. And so his twin, he was the vegan one, and his weight went down a big 3.5 pounds yeah. in eight weeks. By the way, men who do PhD drop about 3.5 pounds in a week, but I know that wasn't the goal per, here. Per week. Yeah, per week. He didn't <laughs> yes. have a lot to let go of. Okay. So he dropped three and a half pounds in the eight weeks, he dropped 2.8 pounds of that came from fat and 0.5 pounds of that came from muscle. So there we go. He dropped a little bit of muscle. Yeah. And so what fat. was funny is they're, they're using DEXA for this. And, you know, DEXA has a, a margin of error that's probably bigger than some of these changes. But um, let's just say that this is true. Mm -hmm. This is an example. And this is one couple. But this is an example of the vegan lost weight and... Um, 
some, the majority of it was from fat, mm -hmm. but some was from muscle. So whenever you lose weight, you're generally going to lose some muscle. Um, but my concern here is that if he continued on this over the course of the next 12 months, I guess in this case, the next 10 months, um, he would lose about three pounds of muscle over the course of that year. That's not an acceptable amount for me. Um, so I would want to, you know, just tweak it. Be like, hey, maybe you can continue to eat a vegan diet, but you need to eat more protein. Mm -hmm. Also, there were some differences between these two and how they were working out. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that they pointed out. So there's a lot of variables here, but let's, let's keep going to Wendy and Pam. So these are two uh, kind of funny ladies. Um, so give us the uh, the vegan versus omnivore, omnivore difference here. Yeah, so Pam was the vegan. She dropped 7.6 pounds. One pound of that was fat, and she dropped 6.6 .6 pounds of muscle, which is oh huge. <laughs> so 87% of that weight yeah. lost came from muscle mass, yeah. which is a big deal. That's frightening. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely frightening. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And then the omnivore. Um, she dropped three and a half pounds. Her fat went up 0.3 pounds and muscle went down 3.8 pounds. So she still dropped muscle, but just not as yeah. much. So arguably, you look at both of these and you're like, neither of those look good. Mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't want I don't want any of these. Um, and so they talked to these uh, two after they did the measurements. And um, it turns out that they kind of deviated from the program. They both started eating less, so they were actually mm -hmm. eating less than what was given to them or recommended to them. They didn't like all the beans. They didn't like the beans. <laughs> and then they added cardio. Yeah. So this is like a great example of like, you can lose weight if you if you eat less and move more, mm -hmm. but you're gonna lose muscle. Um, and we've, we've seen that over and over again as well. Not in your program. No. But in research. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, and then this uh, next couple, Carolyn and, mm -hmm. and um, Rosalind. 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 Yep. So the vegan lady, she dropped 7.9 pounds. That was five pounds of fat and three pounds of muscle. And then her sister dropped 8.1 pounds, 7.7 uh, .7 pounds of fat, and muscle went down 0.2 pounds. Yeah. And so the second one there was omnivore, mm -hmm. and the first one was vegan. And so this is a, a, another great example where they, they lost about the same amount of weight, right? But the vegan lost five pounds of pa five pounds of fat, three pounds of muscle. Three pounds of muscle in eight weeks is a lot. It is a lot. Um, and then the omnivore maintained her muscle essentially, lost zero point two pounds, uh, which is probably within the margin of error. Mm -hmm. um, so and then oh and then these these two younger brothers. So mm -hmm. I like this one because they actually fed these guys more. Mm -hmm. So they were like, no, 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 no. You guys are too active. You need more food. So they fed them more, which probably meant more protein too. And so what we see is that the omnivore gained 7.1 pounds of muscle in eight weeks, which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. And these guys were getting after it though. They were working out hard. They were eating like, I think right on, on point. Um, and then the vegan uh, gained 2.3 pounds of muscle. And what was so funny is they, they sort of like threw their hands up. They're like, he did it. And they hailed it as a win. Mm -hmm. They were super excited. Um, but his brother gained over three times as much. <laughs> but that wasn't a win, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then they talked about visceral fat a little bit. I, honestly, in my opinion, with the measurements they were making, they didn't talk about it with very many people. Um, I don't think that there was much of a difference. And it was within the statistical yeah. margin of error. DEX is not that accurate for DEXA. Um, sorry, Dex is not that accurate for visceral fat, mm -hmm. in my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, an MRI scan is what the gold standard is when it comes to measuring visceral fat. Yeah. They should have done that. And they but. didn't pu They didn't publish um, visceral fat numbers mm -hmm. either. So, all right. So then let's get down to the actual number of results. So now we're going to switch over to the publication. So um, in this results graph, you can see that LDL did change significantly uh, in the vegans versus the omnivores. We see this all the time. People go on a plant-based diet, their LDL will go down, mm -hmm. right? The question is, is, is that better? So why don't you walk us through the triglycerides and HDL and um, give me your thoughts. Yeah, well, so for from the results, we can see that the omnivore folks increased their HDL, which at the beginning of our discussion here, we talked about being a key indicator of of good mm -hmm. health, good heart health. And we also want to see triglycerides drop down. And we saw that with the omnivore group as well. So with the vegan group, we saw HDL decrease and we saw triglycerides increase. And this is a pattern that we do not want to see. No. 
you know, in fact, this is like HDL went down by over 10% mm -hmm. and triglycerides went up by almost 10%. Um, yeah, that's metabolically unhealthy. So when I'm treating people for lipid dysfunction, we're looking at cardiovascular disease. If I see this change, I'm going to change how we're treating them. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't care as much about the LDL. It's a factor. I just don't think it's the most important factor. I think metabolic health is more important and they are metabol metabolically worse off. Well, and the thing is, again, in both camps, it's only been eight weeks. Right. And when we're dropping fat, we're mobilizing fat, our cholesterol levels are going to shift. I mean, this isn't indicative of anything, really. Right. I mean, really, these folks need to drop all their visceral fat, all that belly fat, and they need to maintain it for about three months. And then we can do these numbers and see what yeah. happens. But I, I think the other ones are interesting, too. So we talk a lot about insulin. And, and I think people will look at this and they will say, well, the vegans had a lower insulin level. Their mm -hmm. insulin level went down. And that's a good reason to eat a plant based diet. And doesn't that say that your you know, metabolic theory is wrong? Mm -hmm. But remember what I said out of the gate, which is that they were eating a calorie restricted diet. If we restrict calories enough, insulin is going to go down. Mm -hmm. Right. You're going to lose weight, but you're going to lose muscle mass. And that's the problem. The other thing I like to point out in here is the B12 went down uh, statistically out of the gate. Um, we know that, that, that a vegan diet is, is B12 deficient, so that shouldn't really be surprising. And then they talked about the sex organ blood flow thing. I'm not going to waste time there. Um, the TMAO, they talk about this thing called TMAO. I don't even want to talk about it because it's just not a good biomarker for anything. It's a, a byproduct of the microbiome. Um, so that and the microbiome changes, they didn't even talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they, they weren't impressed. Um, and then they talked about the, um, uh, the telomeres again, again, for eight weeks. What the heck does all that mean? So um, I think in summary, from a body comp perspective, they, they were looking to cherry pick data. They wanted to show that it was better, but it wasn't better. Right. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, you look at those three, if, you, if I were to pick a winner, Try to be non-biased on this. But if I were to pick a winner mm -hmm. from the body comp, what would you pick? Omnivore. Yeah, clearly. Um, all the vegans lost muscle mass except for the guy that they overfed. Um, and which, again, if you if you do a, a vegan diet correctly, if you do it with enough calories and with enough protein and your stomach can tolerate it, you can put on muscle mass. Mm -hmm. It is possible. It's just hard. Um, so I think that, that that is really the challenge. So then I wanted to f finish by going back to that statement by Nemal Delgado, the trainer. He said, if you don't have muscle, you will be unhealthy. And I think that they clearly showed in this very well laid out documentary that if you go vegan, you're going to lose muscle unless you overeat and train really hard. And so now they are feeding kids vegan diets in schools and in hospitals, they're really forcing our yeah. sick community in, in to, yeah, yeah. to only eat a vegan diet. And you know, when you're sick or when you've had surgery, you're healing from something, you actually need more protein to help with that. And here it's stripping it away. Yeah. And adding, adding more carbohydrates to people that are already carbohydrate intolerant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the school part is, it really, really frustrates me. They have meatless Monday and they have, um, something on Friday, something Friday, uh, which is also meatless. Yes. Um, and they say it is for their health and it's for the environment, but I've yet to see any evidence to say that it's for their health mm -hmm. and uh, I've yet to see any compelling evidence that it's good for the environment. So I think that they're really educating kids the wrong way in New York. And, uh, I know a lot of people that have run from New York mm -hmm. for a lot of those reasons. It's really sad. So then my summary is that this study shows that if you look at the data, calorie restriction has health benefits in the short term, mm -hmm. but results in muscle loss. Um, omnivores did better overall. They had better metabolic function. The primary endpoint of LDL doesn't really, uh, doesn't impress me because if metabolic function is getting worse, I don't think lowering LDL by 10% is favorable. Um, the body comp data shows greater muscle loss in vegans, and there was no environmental claim that was convincing in the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what's your summary of that all together? My summary is don't let this show make you fearful and not enjoy your steak dinner. Mm -hmm. That's nice. It. Nice. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like and subscribe for more. And in the comments below, let me know if you like this type of content and share with me what you'd like me to react to more in the future. Remember, you've got to step up to make the change. Lead with your heart, train your mind, and do not negotiate with your body. 
See you next time.